I'll go live. All right. So I need to share my screen. Hello. Welcome, everybody, to Sussex Vision uh, series. Uh, my name is Jose Moya Diaz, and today I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Professor Serge Picot from the Institute of Vision in Paris. Um, so um, today, Serge will be giving a really exciting talk titled Genetic Based Brain Machine Interface for Visual Restoration. And I will give you a brief introduction about uh, Serge's uh, background. So Serge is the director of the Paris Vision Institute since January uh, 2021. And after a PhD in Marseille, uh, and studies in Frankfurt and the University of California in Berkeley, he returned to Strasbourg and then to Paris to launch his own team on retinal information processing, enlarging then the focus to neuroprotection. His team, uh, for instance, revealed how an antipileptic drug is leading to retinal degeneration. More recently, uh, the team has moved to developing the strategies for restoring vision in blind patients. The work involved novel material for electrodes like graphene and diamond or event-based camera for visual information processing. His team has validated the photo photovoltaic and wireless retinal implants ex vivo and in vivo on the blind primate retina, paving the way for clinical trials by the company Pixium Vision. As an alternative to retinal implants, optogenetic therapy was the evaluated on rodents and primates, opening the path toward the clinical trials for the company Genside Biologics. The Timor Serge is now moving toward visual restoration at the level of the visual cortex for patients with optic neuropathies. So Serge, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And we are really pleased that you will give a talk with us today. Hello. Oh, Sergey. Sorry, you are you are you are me. Uh, okay. So, but I, I hear you three times. So there's a delay when you were talking. I was. Yeah, there is a delay. There is a delay. Exactly. There is a, a little delay because of the streaming connection. But you can now uh, can share. He, he should maybe he has opened the YouTube, so he should yeah. close yeah. it. All right. So yes, it's ready. That's fine. So yeah. So you can share your screen now, and we can go. Yeah. Um, you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, perfect. I think you are in presentation mode. Uh, maybe, yeah, you should. You should open straight away from the PowerPoint. Is it okay now? Uh, no, you're not sharing at the moment, sorry. You need to share it. Yes, perfect. Okay, so yeah. So thanks, Sergey, again for accepting our invitation and welcome to Sussex Business Series. Okay, sorry for the, the delay and the slight problems. So I, I will know. Uh... 
Okay, so I will introduce the different Okay. I, I will start to present the, my presentation on all visual restoration. It's very disturbing because I have an echo of myself. He may have opened the YouTube. Tell him. So, um, um, so, so, um, so probably you have the YouTube uh, window open. So what I suggest you is that maybe you should close the YouTube uh, window and just carry on with the Zoom presentation. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So let me you now introduce the the strategy for restoring vision and especially the new genetic based brain machine interface. So I have some conflict of interest that are presented here. And uh, let me so first I wanted to introduce the 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 vision uh, the Paris Vision Institute. And uh, <clears throat> our interest in Paris is to, uh, to prevent blindness and to restore vision. So we know that losing eyesight is what is the most uh, problematic handicap because you're not only losing vision, you're also losing your autonomy. And this is what, uh, when you ask patients, they are ranking uh, blindness as the worst condition, as you can see here. And this uh, will increase in time because as you see, I mean, there are um, an increase in blind patients that should double in the next 20 years. And the number of uh, impaired, visually impaired patients should triple in this time. So this is due to aging, uh, especially aging due to age-related macular degeneration and to uh, glaucoma, I mean, uh, the, the increase in blind patient is due to these two disease. And so we want to, to try to see how we can uh, prevent this disease. So the idea is that uh, at the back of the eye, you either lose the photoreceptor, and this is age-related macular degeneration or some rare disease, or you lose the retinal ganglion cells uh, that are communicating the information to the brain. And this is diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma. So at the Vision Institute, we're trying to develop therapeutic strategies. Uh, so either for complex disease, monogenetic disease, and this was found on gene therapy for liver optic neuropathy, or we are trying to impact on the neurodegenerative process, like uh, with the broad derived cone viability factor as a gene independent therapy, or some kind of cell therapy uh, using uh, cells that are produced uh, from stem cells. And what I want to introduce today is what we do when patients are becoming blind and uh, how can we restore some vision in these patients. So uh, the, the idea of restoring vision is that if you lose photoreceptors, uh, you still have a, a retinal network that is still present and uh, with the bipolar cell and especially also the ganglion cell, the ganglion cell that are sending the information to the visual cortex. And different uh, strategy for restoring vision have been developed by from subretinal, epiretinal and optic nerve uh, uh, stimulation. And so I will come back especially on the subretinal stimulation. But also, I mean, the, the idea is that when you lose the retinal ganglion cell, there are no connection from the eye to the brain. So if you want to restore some vision, you need to do it at the level of the visual cortex. And I will end on this, my talk. So the, the question of restoring vision is what should we do? And 
as you can see here on these uh, first uh, images, is that if you have a, a matrix of 60 pixels, you cannot recognize faces. It's very complex, but you already uh, uh, can start to recognize faces with 625 pixels. And uh, as soon as you go above 2000, it's clear that you can uh, see uh, the, the, the faces. So we need to restore at least several hundred pixels. And another question is the refreshing rate of these images. Uh, we know that uh, when we watch the TV, it's a video rate of at least uh, one image every 30 milliseconds. So this is what we should aim at. So when, when we have uh, lost photoreceptors, this is the case of age-related macular degeneration. And in this case, the patient are losing the central uh, vision uh, where we have a central scosoma, but they keep peripheral vision. And then there's other disease, rare disease like uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And in retinitis pigmentosa, the patient are losing first peripheral vision. And unfortunately, they are also losing the central uh, vision. So these patients with retinitis pigmentosa were the first patient to be included in clinical trials because they have no sight at all. And then uh, the, the patient with age-related macular degeneration were then uh, later involved if the mm -hmm. device can provide better resolution than the peripheral vision. So this was the case for this implant. So I will not introduce too, too much the other implant, but this retinal implant called Prima was developed by Daniel Palanker at Stanford. So you can see this implant, it's uh, non-wide at all. It's a, a fully independent implant. Uh, each unit of this implant is uh, produced by a central electrode here a stimulating electrode. There are peripheral photodiode, infrared photodiode, and a ground grid here around each unit. And so the, the, the size of this unit are 100 microns. And uh, as you can see here, you can have several of these units. And uh, on the first clinical trials, there were 37, uh, 3, 7, 8, uh, of these uh, units. So what Daniel Palenka had shown is that if you put such an, uh, an implant here above the retina of a blind rat in such a recording unit, uh, you can record the ganglion cells, the spikes of the ganglion cells, and especially when you stimulate with infrared uh, the, the implant, you can record these spikes into the retinal ganglion cells of the blind retina. So it's possible to reactivate the, the cells and especially the bipolar cell that then communicate to the retinal ganglion cell the information. Then he showed in vivo that if he stimulates the, the implant with stripes, he can more or less measure the visual evoke potential and thus measure the visual acuity of the animal, showing that in fact the visual acuity with the implant it's fairly close to the visual acuity of a normal animal in blue. So with this, I mean, uh, our, our startup Pixum Vision uh, convinced uh, Daniel Palenka to produce these implants in uh, France. And so they were produced uh, by the startup company. And uh, the, the question was, can we transfer these implants to patients? And so before we would transfer this patient to implant, uh, to this implant to patient, uh, we decided to test them on non-human primate because the size of the cells in non-human primates are closer to the ones in patients. And also the, the types of cells are also very similar. So this is what we did. And we first did tested these on isolated retina, but because we have no 
blind retina. What we did was to take a normal uh, retina of an animal that was euthanized for other reasons than our experiments. And with this retina, we sliced it down in the thickness so that we could generate a blind retina. Then we would put the implant here above the retina and record the activity of the retinal ganglion cells with such an electrode array. So with this, we could stimulate with infrared the implant so that it would generate current in the tissue and then test whether we had spikes induced into the retinal ganglion cells. And the response was yes, we can record spikes into retinal ganglion cells. And what was very interesting was that if we attribute each of these spikes to a ganglion cell, we can show that some ganglion cell like this one here, this ganglion cell is stimulated only by pixel 60 and not by the neighboring pixels, indicating that we had a high spatial resolution with these implants because two neighboring pixels were not stimulating these ganglion cells. After this ex vivo result, we went to in vivo experiment to test the, uh, these implants. So what we did was to introduce the implant below the retina of a non-human primate. You see here the optical section of the retina. And what you can see is that the, the photoreceptor layers are disappearing above the implant, and this is clear here. If we label the photoreceptors at the level of the implant, here in green, they disappear as compared to the neighboring area. So in fact, this area uh, just above the, the implant is, is becoming a blind spot. And so if we generate a behavioral test where we ask the, the animal to watch a central spot and then present a peripheral spot, asking the animal to generate a saccade toward the peripheral spot. He can generate saccade in all directions of sight, except at the position of the implant, because this is a blind spot. But if then we do infrared stimulation at that position, we can see that the animal is not generating a visual saccade in this area. So this indicates that the animal is staying in infrared with the implant, but not in visible light. Uh, this was uh, done with a spot of light that was sufficient to activate only one single unit of the implant, indicating again that we, had a, that we have a high resolution with this implant. So this enabled us to go to clinical trials. And so the, the patients were implanted. You see here the implant in an area that was in fact the area, the scotum of a patient with age-related macular degeneration because the expected visual acuity was higher than the peripheral vision. And in fact, you see the patient here are wearing goggles allowing to keep peripheral natural vision. The rod here is uh, taking images with a camera above the rod. And then at the back of this rod, you have a, a video projector projecting an image in infrared on the implant here in the ellipse, in the pink ellipse. So here you see that the patient is able to read letters on the movie. And uh, in fact, in this case, the patient was tested with some uh, goggles that were completely black uh, so that he could not read uh, with the peripheral natural vision. The visual acuity is close to one over 20. So it's 20 over 460 or 20 over 565. And what is also very interesting is that the patient can fuse the artificial infrared vision 
with the peripheral natural vision. So with this technology, uh, so the patient can recover some useful vision, but we cannot reach cellular resolution. Uh, each unit is of 100 micron, so it's much above uh, the size of uh, photoreceptors, which are approximately a few microns in the very center of the retina. And uh, <clears throat> we have only 378 uh, units on the implant. So how could we improve and try to uh, get to cellular resolution? So it's why we decided, so it's, this is just to, to show you that we can reduce maybe the size of the implant, but at some point we cannot go further because the, the stimulating electrode will come close to the ground grid and we will not have any current getting into the tissue. So the, the technology that we developed to try to reach cellular re resolution is optogenetic therapy. So the idea is to use uh, protein opsin of algae uh, because we, you have a photosensitive uh, opsin in, uh, in algae that are ionic channel. So the idea is to take the uh, genetic code of these uh, opsins to introduce them into an AV, inject the AV into the eye so that the, the AV would diffuse to the retina and then neurons will start to express these uh, opsins. So this was done uh, first by uh, Zhao Pan in Detroit. He was the first to introduce channel uh, to into retinal ganglion cells. You can see the expression here in the retina of an AD1, ret AD1 mouse with no photoreceptors here. And you see this expression here on a section with, in, into these ganglion cells. And when he shine light onto these uh, retinal ganglion cells, you see that the ganglion cells are generating spikes during the stimulation, the light stimulation. So it's possible to restore some activity in the ganglion cell using this optogenetic therapy. So we decided to move this uh, towards clinical trials. So we introduced not channel rhodopsin, but catch into retinal ganglion cell. You see the expression in non-human primates in, in the peripheral, uh, uh, on a peripheral ring, macular ring, simply because at the macula, the, all the, the neurons are pushed aside. And so if you take a piece of this retina and put it in an electrode array, you can record here on each of these electrodes the spikes of radian ganglion cells. And even if you introduce some synaptic blockers in the chamber, you can record these spikes, so the spontaneous activity. And if you shine light, you see that you increase the spiking rate of the radian ganglion cell, and that this increase in spiking rate is correlated to the position of the transfected ganglion cells we see that we have approximately one third of ganglion cells that are transfected. In this case, we use CATCH, which is sensitive into the blue range and uh, with a maximum at 460. So we decided to move to a red shifted uh, opsin, CATCH, uh, crimson. And you see crimson is the most red shifted opsin. And we did this because we know that the blue range uh, light is toxic and we need a high amount of light because these opsin are less sensitive than uh, our, our photoreceptors. And so we decided to test different vectors and we selected av 27 m 8 as the best vector and the best opsin was Crimson Air uh, fused with TD tomato. In fact, the fusion with TD tomato was increasing the expression of crimson. 
What you can see here is the recording of the retina of a non-human primate. You can see that the activated electrodes are really correlated, well correlated to the position of the moving bar. In this case, the image was slowed down four times so that you could see the, the moving bar. And so we have a fairly good uh, spatial resolution because you see that the activation was really uh, moving with the moving bar. And then if we uh, look onto the, <clears throat> the next graph here, you see here the duration of the stimulation. And you see that with 20, 30 milliseconds of stimulation, we reach almost the plateau here of the activity of the retinal ganglion cell, indicating that we can stimulate with images presented every 20 to 30 milliseconds. So this enabled us to move to clinical trial. And so uh, first, yeah, we also uh, controlled that we had no immune reaction uh, in uh, this non-human primate because we have to realize that uh, we are decorating retinal ganglion cells as um, algae with the ionic channel that is in fact uh, getting outside of, of the, the retinal ganglion cell. So in order to move to clinical trials, we had to generate goggles so that there would be a camera uh, to, to get in, uh, in visual information and then project at the back of the goggle light in at 600 nanometers, which is the peak of sensitivity for crimson. And in fact, we need those goggles because we need to normalize the light level in a high range uh, for, to activate crimson. So the camera that were used are kind of special cameras that are not taking photos every 30 milliseconds, but instead each pixel is completely independent. And you see that each time uh, the light intensity is increasing and passing a threshold, the, the camera is sending an event here. So we, you have positive and negative events here, and you see the kind of visual information that are uh, sent to the camera with the positive and negative events. And then you can actualize the intensity level by measuring the light level. So this is very interesting because there is no uh, <clears throat> saturation, even if you watch the sun, and so you you can uh, the patient can watch in all direction. So no, these are the the results of the first patient we seeing by optogenetic therapy. So it's maybe the type of uh, camera we use give this kind of vibrating impression to the to the patient. And you see, you can find objects like uh, this uh, staple box. You can also count objects on the table. And so the, with this uh, type of uh, information, the patient can also detect some uh, very light contrasted objects. As you can see here with this uh, model of uh, alcoholic gel. Okay. 
So we, we have been working on other strategies like uh, introducing uh, some uh, up, opsin into what we call dormant cones, uh, because in the retina, <coughs> uh, we've seen that uh, during uh, photoreceptor degeneration, we have some photoreceptors that remains despite they lost their auto segment. And the idea was that uh, in patient, a blind patient could still have these uh, uh, photoreceptors and it's possible to reactivate these photoreceptors as well. And then the information processing is much better than if we reactivate ganglion cells, of course. So now I would like to uh, switch to the other types of uh, visual restoration when patients are losing the ganglion cell, is it possible to restore some vision by directly stimulating the visual cortex? So this was done in a long time ago uh, by uh, Brindley and Lewis, and where you see they did have electrodes on the visual cortex transistors to communicate the information and that it was possible to stimulate different electrodes and the, the patient would report phosphine in his visual field. So indicating that there's really a correlation between the stimulation of electrodes on the visual cortex and the perception in the visual field. Unfortunately, uh, these devices were not stable in time, so there are no yet commercial devices available. But uh, recently, there were some new development, especially here <coughs> from the company Second Sight, where you see that with electrode at the surface of the visual cortex, it was possible to stimulate uh, these electrodes and so that uh, the patient could perceive shapes. But as you can see, it was uh, done by some kind of sequential stimulation of the electrode and taking a fairly long time so that it's not possible to use it in a very dynamic mode. Uh, to avoid this uh, kind of long uh, sequencing uh, sequence of stimulation, uh, others have thought that as it's possible to activate with a smaller current in the depths of the, of the visual cortex. You see here that in order to either delay a saccade or elicit a saccade, if you stimulate in the depths of the visual cortex, you need less uh, current uh, to induce the, the saccade or to delay the saccade. So, uh, Peter Olselma, for instance, introduced such uh, penetrating electrode in the visual cortex and so that he could record first uh, where the stimulation of the electrode was generating a phosphine in the visual field. And then the idea was to demonstrate that if you then uh, shine a letter or what would be the the form of a letter recorded by this, uh, when you present a letter in the visual field, what are the electrodes that are activated uh, in the, on these arrays, you can then stimulate the same electrodes and try to see whether the animal can report the presentation of the letter. So here is a test. Normally, if you present a letter in the visual field, the animal can generate a saccade afterwards when we present two letters. So in some way, he's telling you, yes, I've seen the T letter uh, in the previous uh, <clears throat> um, So when you stimulate the electrode that were activated when you present a letter, what was very interesting was that in this case, the animal can also report having seen the correct letter. So this indicate that stimulating in the depths of the visual cortex can generate perception. And so this was also achieved in patient by uh, the group of Fernandez in, in Spain, 
where he has also introduced such penetrating electrode in the visual cortex, and uh, the patient can then also report seeing letters like E, L, O, and uh, <coughs> indicating that stimulating in the depths of the visual cortex might be much more efficient. The difficulty with this uh, penetrating electrode is that they generate some kind of damage and that in fact, uh, the visual uh, perception is lost, uh, is likely to be lost after some time because uh, I mean, different studies have shown that there's a big uh, reaction, gliosis around the electrodes with, this, with such uh, electrode arrays. So at the Vision Institute, we have moved and tried uh, first optogenetic, but it was not uh, very positive. So we have moved to another strategy, which, which is called sonogenetic therapy. So what is sonogenetic therapy? The idea is that instead of using an opsin, we are using a protein that is mechanosensitive, take the genetic code of this protein, introduce into an AV, inject the AV, so that neurons will start to express uh, this, uh, this mechanosensitive protein. And then the idea is to generate an image, an ultrasound image onto the brain, which will represent, in fact, what is captured by the goggles. So first, Yes, we can project that image because you can uh, nicely uh, make uh, some uh, uh, some image ultrasound images as is done uh, very often uh, to to see babies in in, in, the, in mothers. <clears throat> so it's if it's possible to do images very deep into the body, it should be also possible to stimulate uh, with images also in the brain. So this is also illustrated here. I mean, when you record the activity, uh, the blood flow uh, by ultrasound imaging into the brain. So first, this is a classical images of MRI. And you see that uh, functional ultrasound imaging, you can have a much better image uh, what we've done with this uh, kind of uh, ultrasound, fast ultrasound imaging was to shine light into the visual field of a primate, record the visual activity, and you see that with either uh, 500 milliseconds or two seconds, we have similar kind of response, and we can show exactly where, in fact, in the visual cortex, the neurons are activated when we present a visual stimulus in uh, the visual field. So with this, uh, we were able to generate retinotopic maps, uh, either to an eccentric uh, stimulus or to an angular position. So this really clearly indicates that it's possible to do imaging in the brain. In this case, we had to remove uh, the skull, but we can uh, leave uh, the dura. So it's possible to do nice imaging. We also uh, tested whether we could see the, uh, the ocular dominance column, which were only reported in the depths of the visual cortex by autoradiography. And <clears throat> what you can see here is that with ultra-fast ultrasound imaging, we can visualize these uh, ocular dominance column with very good precision, even very deep here, as you can see in the visual cortex, like it was possible with uh, autoradiography. So we have a good imaging solution with ultrasound. Can we have also a good uh, stimulation of the visual cortex. So what we did was to inject AV into the visual cortex of rats. Uh, we could see that we have a nice expression into the cortical neurons. 
so the idea was then, can we record these neurons when we do ultrasound stimulation, either with an ECOG array, as you can see here, or with a penetrating electrode into the brain. So here you can see the, the results. With a penetrating electrode, you can see that we can measure, of course, visual response uh, to light stimulation. But we can also record some ultrasound response if we have injected the EEV previously. And you see that the latency here, which was at least 50 milliseconds, is much shorter when we do a direct stimulation of the visual cortex, of course, because the neurons are immediately activated. There's no need of transfer of, of information from the eye to the visual cortex. If we did not inject the AV, of course, ultrasound are not generating any activity in the visual cortex. <clears throat> we can repeat the activity. You see that we can stimulate uh, with 20 milliseconds and we have a nice activation of the visual cortex. Uh, we can also stimulate with different frequency and up to 13 hertz. Now, can we, so this gives us the high temporal precision of the stimulation. What about the spatial resolution? So to measure the spatial resolution, we use uh, ECOG arrays at the surface of the visual cortex. With these uh, <coughs> uh, ECOG arrays, we can measure visual response, which are quite classic. Then if we have no AV injected into the visual cortex, there's no response to ultrasound. But if we did inject the AVs, we have nice response to ultrasound stimulation. And you can see them here. And then you see that depending on the ultrasound intensity, we have different types of response. And also, if we move the stimulator, we can move the area of stimulation. So meaning that we have a high, uh, we have a good spatial resolution also with this technology. And a resolution that would be highly compatible with uh, visual restoration. Finally, the question was, do we have visual perception. So to test this, what we did was to train the animal to report light perception. And you can see that with time, uh, so the animal can really uh, respond efficiently to light perception. So in order to measure the response to light perception, uh, what we do is we do the stimulation, we wait for some time and we provide water. And we see that during this period, the animal will start to lick, in fact, the tube. And you see that uh, after four days, I mean, the animal has learned that it will receive some water and start to lick uh, the tube. Then we did a test by stimulating the visual cortex with ultrasound. And in this condition, what you can see is that the animal is licking the tube exactly in the same way that he was doing with the visual stimulation, indicating or reporting that he had perceived light during the ultrasound stimulation of the visual cortex. What was really interesting as well was that when we had the, the visual stimulation, the latency was almost 300 milliseconds. But if we perform the ultrasound stimulation of the visual cortex, the latency for the behavioral response of leaking the tube was more in the range of 200 milliseconds. So shorter because, of course, we had no uh, transfer of information from the eye to the visual cortex. So this was shortening 
the behavioral decision to lick uh, the tube. So in conclusion, uh, I've tried to show you that we can induce visual restoration in blind patients with, uh, uh, with age-related macular patient. Uh, the best visual acuity was with uh, Prima. It's, the, it's close to the threshold of legal blindness. The alternative solution is optogenetic therapy. And we, we measured that the, the theory uh, for optogenetic therapy could be a visual acuity close to 20 over 249 or even 20 over 72. So we still need to define in patient what is the actual visual acuity that they can reach. It's still an ongoing clinical trial. I forgot to mention that the patient included our patient with retinitis pigmentosa, and the patient you saw was blind for 14 years. And uh, when he recovered this vision. And uh, our future project is really visual restoration at the cortical level by sonogenetic therapy. So, with this, I would like to thank all, all my colleagues, especially Sarah Cadeni, who did the sonogenetic uh, work. Uh, Mathieu did optogenetic at the visual cortex. Greg did all the optogenetic part. Onto, uh, onto the isolated uh, primate retina. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin Bled did all the imaging by fast ultrasound uh, on, on, the, on the visual cortex. And Paul Henry did all the tests on the implant on the human primates. And uh, Fabrice was very helpful in all the primate studies. And this was done in partnership with uh, colleagues like Denis Dalcara, Jens Dubel, uh, Riyad Ben Osman, and of course, Jose Sahel, who <coughs> has really always uh, uh, put a lot of effort so that we could uh, uh, develop this uh, pro project on uh, visual restoration. And uh, also the company Econis for fast ultrasound imaging, GeneSight, for optogenetic therapy, Pixium for, for the prosthesis, Prima prosthesis, and our colleagues, uh, Michael Tanter for sonogenetic uh, therapy, Yannick Lemer was the clinician for the non human primate, uh, for the studies on uh, visual prosthesis, and also <coughs> Daniel Paranke, who generated the, the implants. Ernst Momberg uh, was also very helpful for all uh, optogenetic therapy and then Boyden provided crimson. So thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot for this exciting talk. Uh, really, really interesting. So we are now uh, waiting for, for questions uh, from the chat. So actually, there is a question from Antonio Hinojosa uh, Garcia, which is asking uh, that what are the advantage of retinal stimulation versus cortical stimulation, and which one do you think is more promising? Well, for for cortical stimulation, it's quite complex because you need to make some intervention onto the visual cortex, so you need to open the skull. Uh, whereas when you do some intervention onto the eye, I mean, you don't have to open the brain. And uh, so it's more accessible as well. Uh, so I think already from a kind of uh, very simple issue of surgery, it's much more accessible. Uh, there are less risk because uh, in the event of something is really going wrong, the, I mean, for a blind patient, you can remove maybe the eye. So I think the risk are less than what you would be having with a patient where you need to open the skull. Then in terms of resolution, I mean, this will be uh, the report from patients. 
But uh, in, in the eye, you have a high, uh, I mean, you can stimulate a very large field of view. Uh, the difficulty is to uh, target the cell in all these, uh, these the, the retinites. I mean, in my, it's not easy at the moment to have uh, uh, <clears throat> some uh, gene therapy in a very large area of the retina. And uh, for prosthesis at the moment, the prosthesis that we are using is only two millimeter by two millimeter. We could maybe have several as I was showing on one slide, but uh, we, I mean, we will see. Patient will be reporting what they see and they will be uh, deciding. Okay, so we are, we're, sorry for the noise from the background. Uh, we're still waiting for questions from the, from or the, the people that is present on the live. I just posted the Zoom link if you want to discuss more in details these ideas with, with Sergey. And I have a question, Sergey. It's about the first part of your talk. You, you talk about the, these implants that are non wired you know so uh, what's the duration of or, or the utility life of these implants and if you can use them again or not at all well the idea is first that these implants are not powered by a battery so it's very uh, it's very nice because as long as they are efficient they can stay in place and they are powered by the light intensity activating the photodiodes. So you don't need to, to have a wire to the battery or anything like that. You don't need also to fill the battery. So, so, so this, is, uh, this is quite uh, easy to, to manage. So I think this is one first thing. Then the stability. I mean, all the tests that were done ex vivo, like accelerating testing, did show that in fact uh, it was uh, it was uh, well. Uh, I mean, well preserved in time. That it was not uh, degrading in time. So, I mean, again, it's only when it will be inpatient for 10 years or more that we will know whether at some point it is degraded and uh, no longer active. Okay. But, but okay. it has been tested for several years already and it's functioning well. Okay, and um, I have another question. This is more a general question uh, about the sonogenetic uh, therapy you have been explaining. When you started, at what are your future projections with, the, you know, in the midterm, and how you see, you know, this therapy could reach a, a real and accessible impact for the whole population. I mean, it's difficult to know. I mean, it will take, I think, uh, longer because we are uh, doing an intervention onto the brain. So you have to open the skull. You have to do AV injections into the brain. So you're also introducing a, a channel into the neurons of the brain. So there's a lot of questions there. But... I think it could be uh, useful uh, in different uh, neurological disease. Uh, we have to do tests. Uh, we are starting to do tests in uh, non-human primates. And we hope to show that it's possible also maybe to, uh, for the primate to, to see with this technology. And if we can show that, then uh, why not starting clinical trials? Okay. So, yes. So, yes. So there is not more questions at the moment from the, from the community. So we will be ending the stream and 
uh, we can stay a bit uh, in online, Sergey, for okay. you know, chatting and discussing more ideas with people who wants to join us. Okay. And okay, thanks everybody who attended to this SAS exhibition uh, meeting, and see you next week. See you next time. Okay, very nice. Okay.